Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to week three of gathering together online to worship God together. Real quickly, before we get started, a reminder that uh, there are a bunch of worship resources to help you and your families and your roommates worship, worship together. Uh, so we invite you to go to our website, calvarytwincities.org backslash sermons, uh, and there you'll find a children's message, sermon notes, scripture readings, uh, and song videos uh, to help you and whomever you're with uh, to worship together. Uh, I think I speak for Pastor Eli and myself when I say that uh, we miss you all very, very much. Uh, We love you all very, very much, and we cannot wait until we can worship together physically uh, once again. Also, we've been overwhelmed uh, by the level of participation of all of you during the week uh, with the online wish, uh, digital worship experience on Sundays, but then the, the devotional videos, the Reformed Reflections. Uh, tons of you are viewing, tons of you are responding, and we're just so thankful uh, to have a community, a covenant community that values worshiping and worshiping together. So thank you for joining us once again today. If you're a a digital visitor uh, to Calvary Church, uh, we want you to know how thankful we are that you're using these resources as well, and we hope and pray that you are blessed by them. Uh, Today, Brenda is going to lead us in our prayers of the people. Erica is going to lead us in our scripture reading. Uh, So a big thank you to them for being here today. Uh, A big thank you to Katie to Cam uh, for her great children's messages that she's been providing A big thank you to Pastor Eli and all his hard work in constructing the online digital worship experience. A big thank you to Steve Hall uh, for being here to record this again today. And a really big thank you to Al Gore for the internet. Uh, Before we have our prayers of the people today, uh, in lieu of a prayer of confession, I thought it would be really meaningful and valuable for us as a covenant community to profess our faith together. And so I invite us all to do this together today Uh, using question and answer one of the Heidelberg Catechism. I will ask the question, and I invite all of you in your homes to respond together. And I invite you to respond knowing that your covenant community, that your brothers and sisters in Christ are doing the same in their homes. People of God, Calvary Church, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And let's say together, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all of my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, All things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful Heavenly Father, you are the creator and sustainer of the universe and yet you know the very number of hairs on our heads. We lift our hearts to you, grateful that you see us and bid us to come into your majestic presence. As Jehoshaphat prayed in 2 Chronicles, Lord, we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. As we face the challenges and uncertainties of these times, Father, We acknowledge that on our own we have no power, but we remember that your word tells us that nothing is impossible with you. Our eyes are upon you. Lord, we praise you for your sovereign control over the world and everything in it. We trust in your perfect plan. We know that your word tells us that the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Although we do not understand, we pray that you would use this virus for your glory and the advancement of your kingdom. As the world faces uncertain times and looks at disease and death around the globe, cause hearts to turn to you and your free gift of eternal life in Jesus. During this Lenten season, cause us to remember your great love for us and your willingness to forgive our sins 
when we turn to you and ask for forgiveness. We confess, Lord, that too often we are quick to look for the sins in others' lives and not examine our own hearts. Search us, O Lord. Forgive our sins and create clean hearts in us that are willing to do your work. In this time of social distancing, draw our hearts to you and to one another. Inspire us to creatively serve those in need by picking up groceries, making a phone call, or reaching out to a neighbor. Father, we lift up to you all of the people who are working on the front lines around the world and in our neighborhoods. We pray for doctors, nurses, and other health care workers. We ask that you would help them to get the necessary equipment for treating this virus and also for protecting their own health. Strengthen them as they tirelessly fight to diagnose and treat the sick. We pray for researchers and scientists. Open their minds to find an effective treatment for COVID-19. Thank you for gifting the physician at the University of Minnesota with the creativity to develop a makeshift ventilator using spare parts, which could be a low-cost solution to the ventilator shortage. Thank you for his willingness to freely share this design online to countries around the world. We pray for our leaders, for the president, our governor, and our local mayors. Please give them guidance through their advisors as to the best methods to protect their citizens. Give them a sense of calm as they communicate with their constituents and grant individuals the desire to follow directives for the health and safety of everyone. Lord, we also pray for all the people who are working to keep our communities functioning. We pray for grocery store, pharmacy, and gas station workers, for mailmen and sanitation workers, for truckers and those who restock shelves. Thank you, Father, for their work and for the fact that we do have access to food and medicine and gasoline. We pray for all of the workers who are working differently, remotely. Help them as they figure out new ways to do their jobs. We pray for teachers who need to learn new systems to educate from a distance. Give them knowledge, creativity, and stamina. We pray for students who are learning at home without the physical support of their teachers and peers. Open their minds to grasp new concepts and give them diligence and discipline to do their work. Father, we pray for parents who are now homeschool teachers in addition to figuring out their changing work situations. Give us all the love and grace of Christ Jesus as we adjust to a new normal. Heavenly Father, we lift up to you those who are especially hard hit by this virus. For those fighting the virus directly, we pray for healing and availability of treatment. For those who have to delay treatments for other health issues, we ask your protection over them. We pray for workers who have lost income or jobs. Help us to find those in need and reach out to them with your love and care. We pray for those who are experiencing anxiety and are struggling with mental health issues and ask that you would be their peace. And we pray for the lonely and ask that you would feel that they would feel your nearness. Prompt our hearts to reach out to those who may need to hear a friendly voice. Help Calvary Church to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Lord, we know that you are a God who is able to do far more than we could ask or imagine. We surrender our own wills to your perfect will and ask all of these things in the strong and matchless name of Jesus, our Redeemer. Amen. Our scripture reading today, as we continue our Lent sermon series, Pictures of the Kingdom, is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. We invite you and your families to follow along in your Bibles at home. Hear the word of the Lord from Matthew 25, 14 through 31. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. 
the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has more will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to be God. God. Let's pray together. Lord God, you have declared that your kingdom is among us and that it is not of this world. Open our ears to hear it. Open our eyes to see it. Open our hearts to receive it. And open our hands to serve it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I would like uh, to start off today by talking not about the scripture passage, but about the Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. And of course, uh, this story by Dickens had a, has a lot of uh, incarnations in the past and in the present. Uh, lots of different uh, filmmakers have tried to capture this story in different ways. And the best of which, in case you were curious, is by far the Muppet Christmas Carol. And I'm guessing that all of us are kind of familiar with the story and kind of familiar with the message. Uh, the main character, Ebenezer Scrooge, he's a, uh, a successful businessman, a wealthy businessman, but he is not a kind businessman. He's a ruthless man. He's a stingy man, and he's not using his wealth and his success for good. And so the story goes that on Christmas Eve, he's visited by his former business partners and the ghosts of Christmas, past, present, and future. And it's clear from his story and from these ghosts that Ebenezer Scrooge has not done well with the opportunities that he's, he's been given. He's not done well with his good life. He's not done well with his wealth. And he is not good and he is not generous and because of his selfishness and because of his greed and because of his pride, he chooses not to be good and he chooses not to be generous. These visits from the ghosts on Christmas Eve are a kind of reckoning, a judgment of sorts, a settling of accounts, a showing of Scrooge's failures. And these accounts then, this act of judgment then motivates Ebenezer Scrooge to live differently and to live the way that he should have been living all along, which he then does at the end of the story. It's tempting for us to think of this parable of the tenants like the Christmas carol. It's tempting to think that Matthew 25 is only about some sort of looking in the mirror exercise. That this parable is designed only to make us think about the way that we are living our lives and to motivate us to live the right way and to get us to think about how we are living our lives with what we've been given. Are we living well? 
with all of the things that God has given us. This is a valuable exercise to look into, into the mirror and to ask ourselves these questions. And there are some similarities, and we'll talk about these similarities in a second. But the overall point of our parable today is different. This parable from Matthew 25 is not only about settling accounts and about getting us to think about whether or not we're being good stewards of what God has given to us. There is much, much more happening in this story. And as usual, the context has something to say to us as we begin to try to understand this parable. And I think it's important to know today that this parable is a series of three parables. You've got the parable of the ten virgins right before this, and you have the parable of the sheep and the goats right after this. All of these parables and this entire uh, passage from Matthew 24 and 25 has to do with judgment, This chunk of scripture begins in Matthew 24 when Jesus and the disciples start to talk about signs of the end of the age. And we also have that same phrase once again, or a similar phrase to what we've had with the other parables. This starts with Matthew 25 verse 1 with this phrase, the kingdom of God will be like And again, as I've said before, it's interesting that Jesus doesn't then give us a theological treatise on eschatology. He doesn't give us a bunch of theological bullet points about judgment. He gives us and he gives the disciples a picture. And the last piece of context that I want to talk about today that we might not understand about this parable is the meaning of this word, talents. This isn't really a term that we use except to refer to the skills or the gifts that we have. In Greek and in this story and in Jesus' time and in Jesus' day, a talent is a very, very large sum of money. Talents are actually the biggest unit of money in the Greek language, in, in the, in the uh, Koine Greek language. However, it's a unit of money that a person could earn using their specific craft or skill. So a single talent is like saying that it's this unit of money that a person could earn over the entirety of their career. So it's kind of a subjective unit of money, but it's a very large unit of money. N.T. Wright says that a talent is what a worker could earn in a 15-year period using their specific skill or craft. So we need to see today that these servants are given huge sums of money. They are entrusted with an enormous gift. Now, what is happening in the picture? What messages does this parable send? I think the first thing that we need to acknowledge about this parable and about this entire chunk of scripture in Matthew 24 and 25 is that as a whole, this passage is about a day of reckoning, a day of judgment, There is a sort of look in the mirror at yourself characteristic to this entire passage and a very clear message throughout Matthew 24 and 25 that there will be a day of judgment. And I think this picture affirms this and and this is what we are speaking about in the Apostles' Creed when when we profess that Jesus will come to judge the living and the dead. Now, I realize today that in our culture, we don't like to use the word judgment. Judgment is taboo. And so it's interesting to me at the same time that we don't like this word judgment. We like the word and we even love the word justice. We love justice. We want justice. 
Judgment and justice involve the same thing. Judgment is about bringing justice. And God, being a God who sees all and knows all of the things that we do or don't do, he can and should provide justice for the things that happen. And Jesus wants his disciples and he wants us to know that there will be a time where you and I are held account, accountable for the ways that we live our lives and what we do with what we've been given. Now, this doesn't mean that we aren't saved by grace. This doesn't mean that we aren't washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and justified by what he has done. However, God will hold us accountable for the way that we live our lives and what we do with what he has given to us. But again, this is not the overall point of the picture. The point of the picture and the point of the parable has to do with the servants and the nature of their service. A big part of the parable and a big feature of the parable is how these servants, these three servants, respond to their master. Jesus describes the first two servants and then he describes the last servant using very intentional words that we might overlook and we might miss. First, Jesus tells us that the first and second servant went out at once. And the Greek word here is immediately. After they have received what their master has for them, this enormous gift that he has for them, they instantly go out to be faithful servants. These first two servants have an eagerness and an excitement to fulfill their master's wishes. They are marked by eagerness. The third servant was afraid. He went away. He dug a hole in the ground and he hid the talent. The third servant is marked by fear. And we might overlook this part, but Jesus very intentionally tells us that the first two servants and the third servant, these two groups, do three things. The first two servants, they go out, or they move, they literally moved out. They went to work, and they gained, or they literally, in the Greek language, they literally won more talents. And all three of these words that Jesus uses to describe the first two servants, they are all aggressive words. They are active words. The third servant is also characterized by three actions, but rather than moving out, he went away. Rather than going to work, he dug a hole. And rather than winning more talents, he hid his talent. One of the central features of this picture of the kingdom is the comparison of these servants. Two of the servants are marked by an eagerness and an excitement to serve their master, and one servant is marked by fear. This parable is not only about what we do with what we've been given. This parable is about why we do what we do, the condition of our hearts, and the nature of our response to our master. This parable then invites us and asks us today, which behaviors and attitudes mark us? When it comes to serving God, are we people of eagerness and excitement? Or are we people of passivity and fear? 
A commentator named Dale Bruner says it like this. All three words of the first two servants, all three words say that activity, not passivity, is the mode of Christian hope. Are we eager and excited to serve God, to use our time and our gifts for him, to build his kingdom and to use well what he has given us? I think it's so interesting that Jesus doesn't only share with us what these two servant, that these two servants gained more talents. He shows us with a clear picture their attitudes. He shows us the spirit in which they do this. Following Jesus is not only about obedience. It's not about checking moralistic boxes. It's not about doing things out of guilt or compulsion or obligation or fear. Following Jesus, using our gifts, building the kingdom, serving God, we do these things because we want to, because we are eager to do so, because we love our master and we want to serve him and we recognize the generous gift that he's given to us. It's ironic to me because so many people think that Christianity is a moralistic religion, a kingdom of rules. No, no. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of people who love their creator, who want to serve him and who want to do well with the gifts that he has given us. Notice too, in this parable, the language of going out versus hiding. I think so many Christians go inward with their faith. So many Christians either shelter themselves from the world, they try to escape from the world to shield themselves and their families, and they focus on themselves and their own personal walk with Jesus, or they focus only on the church family, the family of believers, but they don't go out. There's a sense of mission with these words, of going outside our walls, going out of our comfort zones, thinking beyond ourselves. Which of course begs some very interesting questions right now for us as we are stuck in our homes away from each other. What does it mean right here and right now for us to be eager to serve our God and our Creator? What does it mean right now for us to be excited about serving God and fulfilling our mission right now? What does it mean for us to look beyond ourselves and to go out, even though in many ways we're not supposed to go out? These are good questions for us to think about. I want us to look closely too at the third servant, because Jesus spends a big chunk of the parable talking about what happens with the third servant. And we already spoke about his actions, but why does the third servant say he doesn't do much? Verse 24, the servant says, the third servant says to his master, Master, I knew that you were a hard man So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. The third servant thought or thinks that his master is a hard man. The first two servants are eager and excited to serve their master and the the third servant thinks that he is a hard man. When the first two servants serve their master, the master rejoices and encourages them and celebrates with them. And so the picture that we are shown here is that it's clear that the third servant does not really know his master. And I want to wonder with you how many people out there, even how many Christians, maybe even for you, How many people think that God is a hard master? 
that he is stern and that he is an angry master who does not rejoice with us and does not encourage us and does not really care about us and who does not love us. Do we misunderstand God and are we Christians who hide? who don't really know the master, and so we are afraid to go out. I find this to be the most powerful and the saddest part of the story, where the servant says to the master, I knew you were a hard man. And so I was afraid. I was afraid to use your gift to me, and so I hid your gift, your talent to me, in the dirt. Bible knowledge pop quiz for all of you today. Can you think of another biblical story where someone was afraid, so they hid? Genesis 3, the story of Adam and Eve. What Adam says to God in Genesis 3 sounds almost exactly like what the third servant says to his master. Adam says to God, right after he and Eve eat of the fruit, he says to God, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. It's clear that the master and the first two servants have some kind of meaningful relationship. These first two servants are eager and excited to serve, and when they do, the master encourages them, he builds them up, and he invites them to celebrate and to be happy with him. The third servant clearly does not know his master. He thinks he knows his master, but he does not. Our artwork for today is called The Parable of the Talents. And you can see very clearly that the artist picks up on the attitude and the perspective of the servants in the story. The money on the table is really secondary. The two servants, the servants on the left, they are eager and excited. They are excited to serve their master and to give back to him. The third servant is off to the side. He's not sharing in the joy and he's missing something. As he watches the other servants give account of what they have gained, it's almost as if that third servant is confused. He doesn't understand why and how these servants could be so eager and how they could have so much joy. And he's also confused by the master's joyful response. If you're listening to this today and you would call yourself a Christian, but you see yourself in the third servant because you don't have a sense of eagerness, and you don't have a sense of excitement to serve God. This picture of the kingdom asks you today and proclaims to you today, you're missing something about God. This picture of the kingdom invites you to see God, to see your creator and to see his kingdom in a new way. So often people see the Christian faith as a bunch of things to do, a moralistic worldview that is all about checking boxes. And so what makes this picture of the kingdom so beautiful is the love that these servants have for their master and their eagerness to serve him. The kingdom of God is like a place where servants are eager and excited to do their work, to serve their master and to honor him and to do well with what he's given them. Why are these two servants so eager and so excited to serve their master? Because they recognize that the talents that they've been given are a generous gift of grace. 
The gospel message is one in which work and doing good and obedience and being faithful is preceded by receiving. Grace precedes work. We work as Christians. We are faithful with our talents and our gifts as Christians. We are obedient in serving the master because we recognize that we have received so much from our master. People of God, do we cherish and celebrate that our God is good and that he is gracious and generous and gives so much to us? That he is a God worth serving and that he is a kingdom worth serving building. The third servant was not eager and was not excited to serve because he didn't really know his master. He didn't recognize how generous and good his master was. He didn't realize the great gift of generosity that the talent was. Our God is good and gracious. He has freely given us grace. He has freely given us salvation in Jesus Christ. He has freely given us gifts to use, skills to use. He's given us time and breath, and he's given us his Holy Spirit to carry out his will and to serve him. Are we eager and excited to respond. We're going to sing a song right after the message today called Holy Spirit. And we're going to sing that song today because the song is a prayer. And it's a prayer not only us to live, uh, for us to live the way that we're supposed to live, but it's a prayer for God to transform all of who we are, our thoughts and our attitudes to renew us and to make us whole once again so that we can be the people that God calls us to be. Amen. And thanks be to God. Let's pray together. God, we pray that we would not only serve you, that we would not only do the things that you want us to do, that we would not only use our gifts and our time and our lives to build your kingdom, but that we would do these things because we love you, because we want to serve you, because we recognize how gracious and how generous you have been to us. Holy Spirit, breathe new life into us, renew us that we may use our gifts and use our gift of salvation and all of who we are to bring glory to your name. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to sing together the song Holy Spirit and then to come back to this video and to receive the parting blessing. People of God, as you sit in your homes, I invite you at this moment to think about all of your brothers and sisters worshiping in their homes right now and to celebrate that even though we are physically apart, that we are together in spirit and we're all receiving this blessing together right now. People of God, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace both now and forevermore. And everybody said, amen.